Good morning. 
and welcome to First Unitarian Universalist Church of Rochester. We're a church that believes inspiration comes from many traditions and many teachers, and that many spiritual paths guide us in the ways of justice and love. Your faith, your doubts, your questions, your hopes, your identity are welcome here. Families are always welcome in the sanctuary. There's also a preschool playroom open anytime, and there's activities and classes for children following the time for all ages. All are welcome. You can join us after service for refreshment and conversations downstairs in the commons, where you can visit the social justice table to find ways to support various local work. In particular, today you can learn about support for Afghan refugees, which impacts a family that our church has been supporting, as well as information about paid family leave, the Equal Rights Amendment in Minnesota, and more. So visit that table downstairs after service. Throughout the month, our offering plate goes out, out um, to support Hawthorne Helps, a Hawthorne Education Center service offering essential items to folks with limited means. This is a, a long-time UU connection uh, with Hawthorne Education Center. So you can give throughout the month as the plates pass or anytime online as well. Thank you for your generosity. Wednesday evenings, you can join us for supper at 5.30, followed by choir, youth group, and a forum with child care from 6.15 to 7. This week's forum is about the work happening right now in Minnesota to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, guaranteeing equal protection regardless of gender or sex, a protection that is in neither, surprisingly, the U.S. Constitution or the Minnesota Constitution yet. Um, many of you have been following that work for years, um, and we're at a point where there's some good work happening locally in Minnesota as well as throughout the country. So you can learn about that. There's a forum with a guest speaker this Wednesday night. So you can join us for supper at 5.30 and the forum at 6.15. All are welcome. Today we're grateful to hear reflections from Alita Borud and Jennifer Den Sagano on communal care and health care and the theme of doing no harm as an act of love and compassion. Thank you for sharing today. And thanks also to musician emerita Connie Shulka for filling in today for Austin Ferguson, who is with um, his family in Texas for his grandma's memorial. Thank you today to Connie and Joe for music. And finally, save the date for two free concerts coming up. You may have received something in the mail about this. Peter Mayer, who wrote Blue Boat Home, is a UU musician from the Twin Cities, will perform for our annual Pledge Drive kickoff on Saturday, March 4th. Tickets are free, but you need to reserve a space. There's a link for that in the e-news. And then on Wednesday, March 15th, the North, Deca North Dakota State University Concert Choir will perform a free concert here in the sanctuary following the Wednesday night supper. That's March 15th. No tickets necessary for that, and all are welcome. You can see all about these in your weekly e-news. We hope you join us for these fun events. So I invite you to take a breath as we enter our worship time together. With these words from the Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes, our minister in the 1870s, may our faith in humanity and our message of hope and good cheer light our way. It's good to be together. Our opening hymn will call us back in just a moment, but I invite you now to rise and body your spirit, greet those around you, wave to those online.
Our words for the chalice lighting are an excerpt from the poem, Choose to Bless the World, by Rebecca Ann Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, and waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. like to invite the children forward to join me for a story. You can come up here with me. Don't be scared. It's a nice comfy spot to sit. Well, it's nice to have one with the same last name at least. <laughs> Two, come on up. You're going to want to see the whole congregation is going to help tell this story. And you might want to watch them because it might be entertaining to you. <laughs> so I invite you all to come actually sit on the red step and face these folks here. We're going to look this way. So I want to tell you a brief story. See what I have here? You know what that is? See what I have here? It's a, do you see what this is? It's a Band-Aid. I got an owie. I had a little paper cut on my finger. And it reminded me of something that happened to me a long time ago. When I was about five years old, I was running as fast as I could. So I want you to look at these folks. Pretend you're running. You can stay seated. But pretend you're running as fast as you can. Ready? Go. You're going. You're going. They're running. And they're on a gravel road, because that's a smart place to run. <laughs> And then they fall. Oh, and what do you scrape? Your knee. Oh, hold your knee. Ouch. Oh, so bad. So I fell and I scraped my knee. And that happened to you too? Well, yes, it did a couple of times. Yeah. So it's a family tradition. We run on gravel roads and scrape our knees. Do you know I still have a mark on my leg 
from when I fell down on the gravel road and it hurt and there was some blood and like my skin kind of hurt and tore apart and I was crying and it wasn't very good. So I want you to imagine now how long it took to heal and it's still there a little bit. But do you know what the most important thing was? So close your eyes for a second. You keep your eyes open. You up here close your eyes. There were two ways maybe that someone could have helped me. They could have given me a band-aid or they could have given me a little bit of love. And I'll tell you when to open your eyes in just a second. So if, so make a, so if you had just fallen on the gravel road and hurt your knee and then you opened your eyes and you saw this face. So open your eyes. Look at all these mean people. <laughs> they gave you this face and they just said, get better. How would that feel? Mean. Okay, close your eyes again. Let's try that again. I'll try to make them better people. <laughs> now, happy face, open arms. Okay, now open your eyes, and you have an owie, and then you see this. How does that make you feel? So much better. Did you know, thank you, did you know, and sorry to throw you under the bus so easy. <laughs> did you know that our healing, how our body heals, sometimes it's just, it needs a Band-Aid. Almost always it needs some time and some care and you need to change a band-aid, and you need to clean a cut, and things like that. But just as much, at least when I was little, and still now, what I need more than anything is care and love from other people. That helps heal because our heart, even though it's inside, or our soul, or our feelings, can get cut just as easy and feel just as bad as the skin. And it's how it's tended to. How someone shows love and care for us that helps us heal. It all takes a little time, it all takes care, and it's all connected. Our mind, our heart, our body, they heal in the same ways with love and care. So think about that when someone's, you know, maybe is, if they fall down the stairs on the way downstairs, <laughs> or you've done that, uh huh. <laughs> All right, I won't say anything else about that in our family. <laughs> We're very stable. Um, when you think about a time you or a friend are hurt, how can you respond to their pain? With love. Because that will help just as much as anything else. Yeah. So Connie and Joe are going to play the children's benediction, and you're going to meet Chantel over by this store for activities. Thank you. morning. It is good to be with you. I invite you to settle in here as we create a place of communal caring and connection. It's our time to pause amidst the busyness of our lives, to slow down enough to consider the beauty that is here all around us, and to open a space for listening and love. Here we honor all who support us in this caring, loving, and all-inclusive ministry. We send gratitude to Marge, Marge Dalen, serving as our caring coordinator, arranging care for our members and friends in need. The members of our caring committee are, are wonderful examples of our compassionate community, holding us up as we go through challenging and happy times. And life can be challenging. We could all use some extra support with what life throws at us. And if you are experiencing those challenges in your life, we encourage you to reach out for support and help. 
If you need additional care, whether it be personal pastoral care or other assistance, please reach out to Reverend Luke or myself with that request. And today's flowers are shared by Julie Gilkinson in honor of Sandy McLaughlin and Hawthorne Helps, which she hatched and has continued to nurture. Thank you for making our community and world a better place. In this community, we share pieces of our lives with one another. We do this because all people here have value. Each person's experience matters. We lift up those who are experiencing sadness, illness, or loneliness. May the strength and love in our congregation help guide you. We revel in those who are experiencing joys in their lives. May their happiness lift us all, and may their joy filter into all around them. May all of us find love, hope, joy, and healing strength in our community. Please hold Bethany Nolt and her family in your thoughts. Bethany's sister, Kim Mullenberg, suffered a small stroke, and we send her healing strength as she recovers. And we celebrate with Kirk and Joe Payne this morning, who joyfully welcome a granddaughter, Lila Jade, born on February 7th to Elizabeth and Andy Drish. We congratulate this family and welcome this new life to the world. Here, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith is our focus. Let us carry that out into the wider world. May the faith in the spirit of life, love for the community of Earth, and love for the light in each other be ours now and in all the days to come. I invite you to take a deep breath. Breathe deep, breath of life. You'll below you the earth and its ancient turning. Above you the sky and beyond that the stars shining with their ancient light holding you in this moment, this breath yourself made of earth and stars. Know that in this house you are named, you are known as beloved, as sacred. By you into this time of meditation, this time of prayer, first by sharing silence together. Spirit of life, source of love, God of many names and beyond all naming. The birds find a way to weave their song in the mornings, which seems louder on these brighter yet still cold days. How they do that, I wonder, amidst the long days of dark and cold, they sing as if they have some assurance trying to let us know that better days or at least something to sing about is to come. It's a wonder, too, how our own souls do the same thing, how we make it through uncertainty, through pain, through grief, or through loneliness one day, one breath at a time, as if some song of love or possibility or healing sings within us even when we're not sure if we have any words to give it. In the sacred hour, we hold many joys and sorrows in our own hearts, our own and others, some spoken, some silent. I invite you to bring the names of those you're holding in your own heart this day in joy or sorrow, celebration or concern, and silently or aloud now in this time to speak their name. all the names spoken and unspoken, and we all be held in love. These words of meditation are from Kim Stafford, entitled Citizen of Dark Times. She writes, Agenda in a time of fear. Be not afraid. When things go wrong, do right. 
set out by the half-light of a seeker, for the well-lit problem begins to heal. We have not arrived to explain, but to sing. Young idealism ripens into an ethical life, so prune back regret and let faith grow. When you hit rock bottom, dig farther down. Grief is the seed of singing. Shame the seed of song. Keep seeing what you are not saying. Plunder your reticence. Songbird guards a twig. Its only weapon, a song. May it be so. Amen. The hymn is May the Life I've Lived. I'll sing it through once, and then we'll sing it through all together. You can remain seated for our hymn. I've lived, speak for me. May the life I've lived speak for me. At the end of my days, when there's nothing more to say, let the life I've lived speak for me. The first reading is an excerpt from Doctors by Anne Sexton. They work with herbs and penicillin. They work with gentleness and the scalpel. They dig out the cancer, close an incision, and say a prayer to the poverty of the skin. They are not gods, though they would like to be. They are only a human, trying to fix up a human. Many humans die. They die like the tender, palpitating berries of November. But all along, the doctors remember. First, do no harm. They would kiss if it would heal. The second reading is Leaving Early by Leanne O'Sullivan. My love, tonight, Finula is your nurse. You'll hear her voice sing song around the ward, lifting a wing at the shore of your darkness. I heard that in another life, she too journeyed through a storm, a kind of curse with the ocean rising darkly around her, fierce with cold and no resting place, only the frozen rocks that tore her feet, the light on her shoulders, and no cure there but to wait it out. If, while I'm gone, your fever comes down, if the small, salt-laden shapes of her song appear to you as a first glimmer of earth light, follow the sweet, hopeful voice to that landing. She will keep you safe beneath her wing. The ushers will now receive the offering.
When Reverend uh, Luke Stevens Royer asked me to reflect on love, our UU principles, and the Hippocratic Oath, I, I said, well, of course, you know, okay. Hmm. <laughs> sure. Well, I immediately contacted the most gifted provider I know, a geriatric nurse practitioner, and my mentor, Deke Bowman. Together, we sat with patients and their families through end-of-life discussions. So many times we walked into the quiet hospital rooms of grieving families, and Deke had the ability to draw out what was on people's hearts, and in doing so, lifted their spirits, and more times than not, relieved laughter actually followed us out the door. You know, few people know that the Hippocratic Oath says, medicine is an art, and warmth, understanding, and sympathy can have a bigger impact than many of the therapies that we doctors prescribe. Deke embodies that art. I asked her, how does she do it? I listened. God spoke through me, she said. She has a love that submerges her own ego and puts people at the center, recognizing the worth and dignity of the patient and their family. She saw patients as more than a diagnosis and practiced another principle of the Hippocratic Oath, treat the whole person in the context of what illness means for them and their family. I believe deep listening is key to the UU principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Former UUA president, Reverend William Sinkford said, we try to hold ourselves open to the truth emerging within us and around us. Hold ourselves open to new truth. Deke listened for the truth at the center of what patients and families had to teach us. This is probably the most important lesson to learn as a physician. The Hippocratic Oath also says, do not play at God. Have the humility to say, I don't know. I learned that patients often have the clearest understanding of what ails them. If we listen, we can walk with them towards a deeper understanding of their illness. And when patients can articulate the story of their illness, they gain control over it. I think doctors need to be more like shamans and less like omnipotent authorities. I am no longer doctoring, but still driven by what brought me to medicine and this faith this church where we are called to do our good works here on earth. My father, a family doctor, inspired me. Visiting patients in homes, dug out of hillsides with earthen floors, he deeply respected the dignity of every patient. This summer, as I talked with people at their doors, I heard details of their struggles to access health care. A woman broke down in tears with me because her 30-year-old son will not leave his room due to crippling depression. A young couple buried under one and a half million dollars debt, paying for the surgeries of their firstborn son to keep him alive. Countless stories how this healthcare system, capable of miraculous cures, is failing so many of our neighbors. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. In Minnesota, we have an opportunity to make health care more just and equitable. The Hippocratic Oath also compels doctors to take on an obligation to the whole of society. And I'm encouraged to see more doctors and the Minnesota Medical uh, Association standing up to do this because our health care system needs so much healing. An obligation to the whole of society echoes another of our UU principles, the second one, calling us to challenge the powers that be in service to justice and compassion. 
So many of you in this church are healers, whether or not you describe yourselves as such. You're heeding this call. You act out of love and compassion for our neighbors, whether it's feeding the hungry or mentoring our youth. And I am so grateful to be among you. Thank you. So the Hippocratic Oath is lengthy, complicated, and much debated in its translation from the original Greek. It starts with the words, I swear by Apollo. Apollo is the Greek god of healing, but it's a little more complicated since he could also spread disease or bring plague by shooting his arrows. <laughs> Apollo also got into trouble with the other gods for trying to bring his mortal wife back from the dead. Sometimes this is interpreted um, in the beginning of the oath to say that the dedication to healing comes from love. I see love every day in my work in the hospital as a neurorehabilitation physician with patients who, for example, are recovering from spinal cord injury or stroke. These people often have their loved ones by their side nearly every second of the day to help them in their healing. Friends and family sometimes fly in from across the country and the world to provide support and companionship Letters, cards, photos, and flowers come into the hospital room. Reminders of the love people have in the world outside the hospital are ever present. There's also love between the patients and their nurses, therapists, doctors, and other hospital staff. In my area, we sometimes have patients who stay with us in the hospital for months on end, and many of the same people see them almost every day. The relationships and affection that develop are certainly a form of love. And sometimes it's true that love is the best medicine, and the best I can provide for a patient some days is listening or a hug or sharing a little bit about my morning. I look forward to seeing them, and I get to know some of their quirks. I'm sad when they leave that I won't see them every day, but grateful that I shared some time with them and hopeful that maybe we'll run into each other in the future someday. I also see a longing for love every day. Some of my patients don't have family, or friends around to visit them. Loneliness leaves many people languishing throughout the day, feeling bored. The TV might be the only other voice in the hospital room for most of the day. And this sometimes is not the case just for the patients in the hospital. Some have shared with me how much they like being in the hospital because of the prolonged interaction they have with other people. Maybe this has always been the case for some, but I've been surprised by how many patients have so few people that they can rely on. Something I always ask my patients when they are admitted to inpatient rehabilitation is if they have a spiritual or religious tradition that is important to them. It seems nearly universal among my patients who have many visitors, cards, and significant support that they are part of a religious or spiritual community. As we like to say in medicine, correlation is not causation, but in my anecdotal experience, it does seem to matter. We are lucky to have the UU community. 
Our caring committee, for example, puts the UU values into action, and there are many other UUs out there who, if they have been in the hospital, have wonderful reminders of the love, support, and connection this community provides. When my children were born, we too received such messages of support, um, and we still have some of them to this day. One of my patients recently had a card in his room that read, love is like farts. If you have to work too hard at it, it's probably crap. <laughs> so it might be a little crass, but it actually got me thinking about whether that's true or not, at least for the part about love. And while it might be true for love as a feeling, I don't think it's true for love as an action. For example, as the parent of two young children, love, the feeling, is very easy with them. Sometimes love, the action, can be a little bit harder because it means changing blowout diapers and endless explanations of why we have to brush our teeth. In my work in the hospital, love, the feeling, may not be as innate and actually sometimes takes work or at least time. Love as an action can look quite similar because sometimes diapers need to be changed there too and teeth also need to be brushed. While love in the community may be more moderated than this, it still takes effort to show up, to write a card, to be on a cook team, go to choir rehearsal, take care of kids in the preschool playroom, or even put on a Valentine's dance last weekend. These things are love, and this love builds community. When I read through our UU principles, they are a guide for building community like this. Dignity, justice, acceptance, spiritual growth, search for truth, democratic process, and interdependence. Living these principles is putting love into action. I appreciate the opportunity to practice these principles within our UU community because it makes me a better physician for my patients. As my patients do the difficult work of healing, the hospital community we create is one of the most essential medicines. We see how love within community can transform, and my deepest hope is that my patients, particularly the ones most in need of love and connection, will be able to recover and find community in which they can continue to heal. Thank you. They are not gods, though they would like to be, writes the poet. They are only a human trying to fix up a human. Or as another poet writes, these careful tenders always trying to keep the body, the mind, the soul all mixed and mingled together, safe under their wing. These testimonies, thank you, speak to the humanness of everyone in the whole community of health and healing, patient, caregiver, friend. It takes a great cloud of witnesses for health and wholeness. I invite you to bring to mind a caregiver you've known or that you've had. It can take any form, whatever that word resonates for you. Perhaps years ago, perhaps in a crisis, perhaps someone you knew by name, perhaps someone you didn't. Perhaps a routine visit, or in a clinic, or in a home, or someplace you can hardly remember or name, but you can feel in your bones. I invite you to open your hands to receive that memory, the healing that was part of it, even amidst some pain. Think about the presence and the love that person or that team or that place offered to you. Perhaps words, perhaps procedures, perhaps prescriptions, whatever way their love and compassion for your well-being took, took practical shape, which always has deeper levels. Bring to mind their most certain humanness, their hope and their own struggle, to not be able to heal it all, hold it all, the whole person, the whole world, but to offer still miracles of healing in many forms, in many amounts. And take that in, place it on your heart. To 
those caring souls, we offer this blessing and this blessing to your own soul. These are from Jan Richardson. I know how long you have been waiting for your story to take a different turn, how far you have gone in search of what will mend you and make you whole. I bear no remedy, no cure or miracle for the easing of your pain, but I know the medicine that lives in a story that is broken open. I know the healing that comes in ceasing to hide ourselves away with fingers clutched around the fragments we think are none but ours. We see how they fit together, these shards we have been carrying, how in their meeting they make a way we could not find alone. Amen. She writes, making a way we could not find alone. That is what these helping professions do, day in and day out. As an act of love and kindness, an act of skill and precision, an act of listening to mind, body, and heart, attentive to not only the ultrasounds and the images, but just as much the descriptions, the experience, the story, the humanness at the core of paying attention, bearing witness to the soul in pain, in hope, always trying to move toward health, making a way where you could not find one alone, writes the poet. In so many ways, love is the space between us that keeps us connected, that reaches out in care, that reaches out in help, and where the need for help and offering of care meet. Perhaps that's where healing takes place reaching out for help and offering of care. There is a type of love that abides with us, a type of love that is unchanging, a type of love that keeps vigil with us, stays with us at a bedside, at a soul side, in the form of a nurse or a doctor, a stranger or a friend, in the form of flowers at the bedside or a funny card on the window or a silence that goes deeper than the words we know how to hold. May we abide with each other, always making a way together toward healing and love. The hymn is Abide With Me. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing.
invite you, as you're comfortable, to place a hand over your heart or toward the sky or earth in gratitude. For all those souls that abide with us, for those souls that care for us at bedside and soul side, for all those times and places where all we see, where all we know is change or decay or fear, May a love large enough to hold us be in the hands and souls around us and abide with us still. Amen.